your students? Huh? Good. <laughs> Thank you, Joe. So um, we had a little discussion at the uh, at the halftime, um, and the, you know, there was some information earlier uh, that uh, that you can't uh, you can't ever avoid all the fluoride, and therefore you know there's no point in avoiding it or something like that. Um, the lady I showed you that's bent over, she can't avoid fluoride. She's still exposed to fluoride, but she got better by reducing her fluoride intake. Your body will deal with the damage. Could, couldn't stand her back up. Her, her, her bones are ruined, but the pain is gone. So, the, you know, no, you can't get the fluoride totally out of you, but by adding into your diet all the things that your body needs to heal, uh, calcium, magnesium, vitamin C, selenium. I, I met a guy at... Uh, uh, his name's uh, Cook. I met him at um, the Metropolitan Water District and uh, in Los Angeles. Uh, Dr. Thiessen and I were both talking, and he came up to us afterwards, and he said, well, what do you do about fluoride poisoning? He says, I got too much fluoride when I was a kid. And what do you do about that? And, I, and Kathy and I said, in unison, calcium, magnesium, vitamin C, and selenium. And he said, wait, 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 let me write that down. And so he wrote down calcium, magnesium, vitamin C, iodine, and selenium as the antidotes to fluoride poisoning. And he, two years later, he sent me the nicest email and a video of himself out lifting weights and doing enormous athletic things that I wish I could do. And he said, thank me and Dr. Thiessen for helping him recover from fluoride poisoning. So he recovered from fluoride poisoning by sucking down gobs of calcium, magnesium, vitamin C, selenium, and iodine. So it, you can recover from it. So anyway. Um, Speaking of recovering, um, as a recovering dentist, what I do now is I make videos about all the fun things that I used to get to do when I was, uh, you know, uh, working for a living. And uh, so one of the things that uh, uh, the engine that drove my practice was preventive dentistry. And preventive dentistry not for just tooth decay, but gum disease as well. Gum disease is an infection. It is caused by specific organisms. It is not caused by plaque. It is caused by specific organisms, and you don't get them from the toilet seat. You don't catch them in midair. They are probably in your body this moment because 90% of the population have gum disease. I do not. Why don't I have gum disease? Because I got rid of the snakes that I used to have. And so you actually can cure gum disease. You know how they're really reluctant to say cure, cure, cure? You can cure gum disease by getting rid of the organisms that cause it. And I know there's lots of other factors like vitamin C and nutrition and all that, and, and hygiene and all that stuff. But if you don't got the bug, you don't got the disease. And you can prove that to yourself by going to any museum. And if you're in an area of the world that did not have gum disease, you'll look in the museum and those people have perfect teeth with no crooked teeth and bone around all of them. And if you go to an area of the world that does have gum disease, you'll find big moth-eaten holes in the bone. Teeth missing that fell out. Because that's the nature of the disease. Um, I'm going to play just the, the start of let me turn this guy on. Uh, one of my videos that uh, I, have, I have 20 different programs that are playing on public access televisions throughout the United States. I just signed up a, a, another uh, a station, another lady in uh, Berkeley, uh, so I'm playing in Berkeley now. Um, Atlanta, uh, San Antonio, uh, uh, San Diego, Oceanside, uh, Chicago. Um, and so we have uh, um, lots of uh, little topics that we cover, and, and there's, uh, some of them have been put together into an uh, eight-part DVD that uh, just this is our new two-disc two, two DVD of the more popular ones. But uh, um, I, what I always used to do, these, you can get them in bulk. You know, they're cheap. I put up the front desk and, and just have patients, you know, uh, you know, $5 deposit and take that with you. And, you know, if you bring it back, you get your $5 back. And if you want to send it on to your daughter-in-law, then I get to keep the $5. And when the, all the tape, tapes were gone, then I'd send the $5 off and get much more because, you know, a way to educate your patients. So they, uh,
Ever wonder why an otherwise healthy man or woman would suddenly have a devastating stroke or heart attack? They ate right, exercised, didn't smoke or drink to excess, but still, there you are, going to their funeral. There has to be something missing from the cholesterol, flabby, fat, heart paradigm that blames the victim for the disease. And there is. There's a cause. Bad bugs. The kind that make your breath smell bad in the morning. The kind that may make your dental floss pink or your toothbrush pink when you brush. The kind that infects more than 90% of the human population and are treated effectively only by a very few dentists. Bad bugs that look like snakes and eat away at your gums and get into your bloodstream and wreak havoc with your arteries, immune system, not to mention the bone around your teeth. That's a missing link, and it can be corrected. So what she's doing is she's flushing out the gingival collar with, uh, I think, um, Scott, we were using uh, uh, iodine. Uh, you can use We've used chloramine tea. You can use, on real sensitive people, I just use salt water. But none of that's important if you don't have a microscope. Because I have probably trained 15 to 20 hygienists over the years, and not one, well, I should say one lady did, but she would already knew how to do this thing. Out of the 15, only one could effectively deliver to me a patient that was free of organisms after the first visit. It, no reason to have people come back again and again and again and, and scrape the upper, top right and then come back and scrape the bottom right and go back and scrape the bottom left. It's, it's like if you went to the bathroom and tried to wipe one cheek. That's not going to work. That's not how you treat an infection. You have to disinfect the entire oral cavity, and you don't do that by working on eight teeth. You do that by working on 32 teeth. And that's what Lynn is doing here. That was her little baby I showed you earlier. Um, she's irrigating with a cannula, and uh, I don't know if uh, the cannula guys are going to be here this, this meeting, but uh, it's basically a 22-gauge needle that's round on the end and holes on the side, so when you run the water pick, it comes out like a rainbird. And so you just run that around each tooth a couple times, and I insist that we do that before we do an invasive operative procedure because you end up with bacteria in the bloodstream. Well, what good is that? You know, well, you can't prove that that caused this. Actually, you can, because when they do DNA testing, they show that the bacteria on the heart valve came from the mouth. A hundred percent of the people that had wisdom teeth extracted had bacteria in their bloodstream. You know, if we were back in Dr. Siebelweiss's time, we could show that a hundred percent of the women that gave birth at the old allopathic hospital where the doctors would do autopsies at one place and then wipe their hands on the bloody apron and go over and deliver the baby, 100% of those women had bacteria in their bloodstream. 100% of them. So they didn't have that kind of technology back then. And so they said, I like, I like to quote the doctor that helped get Dr. Seamwise driven out of town. He said, there could be nothing on the hands of a learned doctor. Anyway, it would bother a mother and her dear child. <laughs> if he wiped the possum blood off on his hand. So, we get that same statement from dentists. Oh, the mouth has such a strong immune system. It can resist these bacteria in the bloodstream. That's probably true in some cases. And it's demonstrably untrue in others. And that would be in situations where people had uh, mitral valve prolapse um, or deficiency of one of the organs or an artery that doesn't flow well. Um, some arteries don't flow well because of genetics. And then some don't flow well because of a damage to the artery from mercury, causing a cholesterol buildup and permeability of the artery. It makes no sense whatsoever to shower bacteria in the bloodstream. It simply doesn't. So one of the clinical practice guidelines that I have submitted, and uh, it's in the process, is, is prevention of bacterial and, uh, uh, septicemia. Uh, septicemia is bacteria in the bloodstream. Prevention of bacterial septicemia through uh, disinfection of the oral cavity prior to intervention. And this is one of my little funny videos about it. The, the, Scott uh, was kind enough to be uh, the, uh, the victim. And, and we demonstrated that we couldn't find bacteria in his bloodstream because she irrigated him.
<laughs> so we, pro we proved the null hypothesis, which technically can't be done, but if you'll listen to the, uh, the claims of safety for mercury and fluoride, they're all, they're all advocating what's called the null hypothesis. You know, you can't prove that caused this, the null hypothesis. Well, you can't actually, but we can certainly pile up enough evidence. So let's go to bad bugs. So the um, one of the things that I told you earlier that my, drove my practice was, was preventive dentistry. One fifth of the income in the practice came from preventive dentistry. Then, and that's different than um, in the majority of practices because 15% of the money that's paid out by insurance companies to dentists is for prevention or treatment of periodontal disease, 15%. Yet 90% of the population have it. Gee, golly. You think there's a cognitive disconnect between what the problem is and what we're treating it with? I, I think maybe so, is that we can find new revenues right inside our own practice that drive the practice toward better care by, I mean, like you did an eight unit bridge. What is your confidence level that those eight teeth are gonna be there 10 years from today if the person has bleeding gums and a little pus coming out from a couple of them? Pretty low, I would think. But, and so is the patient's confidence also. But if they have pink gums that don't leak at all, then they're going to be you know, much more confident in the ability to stop tooth decay. How come I can't get rid of you? It's misbehaving. And let's see if you'll start this time. started. No? Okay. I know it's brutal, but I'll be brutal. You know what? I bet it's the DVD player. Excuse me while I learn how to run a computer. All right. One last time. days are here again. I should have done this at the break, but then I was answering a lot of questions. But we'll talk about it later. So I still don't have a clock, and my computer says it's 8.45 in the morning. So Somebody give me about a, say, a 30-minute countdown for lunch, and then um, I'll talk for about another 15 minutes to kind of summarize things for you, and then we'll take some questions. And, uh, th that, that work for you, Joe? Okay. So now we have the Macintosh behaving properly. It's old and rickety like its owner. So um, the MF down there, um, is a master and a fellow. And the, the academy has lots of different little um, things you can do to, to uh, uh, show that you know your stuff and particularly enjoy watching how to poison people and that sort of stuff. So I, I did it all. So anyway, that's the... Uh, um, I've, uh, I have to brag, I, I have the only perfect attendance record in the history of uh, the IOMP. The uh, other people had good records that died, so I'm the only person still alive that has that record. So the, uh, you've seen some of these before, and I'm going to try to play this for you. This is the snake-looking guy, but what's in the middle is a white blood cell. The snake is a spirochete. Every species of spirochete goes, causes some horrible disease in mankind. This is an amoeba, the one-celled animal. 
and uh, it, it eats white blood cells. It's, it's actually a, a late comer in the gum disease, but we use it as a barometer of advanced gum disease because it doesn't come in until there's a lot of trouble. It eats white blood cells. Well, how, why were the white blood cells there? There was because there was a disease process there, and so the amoeba comes in and eats your, eats your defenders. Um, so let me go back to this uh, uh, video and go through it again because there's, there's really too much information. You get everybody in this room. Uh, the, fir the first time I saw an amoeba eat a white blood cell was when Trevor Lyon talked to our academy at, at a meeting, and Trevor wrote the book on it. And that, uh, so I thought that was pretty interesting. The, there, and I had a, I've had them, I'd had a microscope for probably 10 years at that time, but I'd never seen that. And the first patient that I saw after I returned from that lecture is this guy right here, this amoeba eating a white blood cell. And you know, it eats it, and it drags it along, and chews it up, and spits it out. Well, you know, who knew it did that? Well, what happens when you do that is the gums just go crazy. You get bleeding gums, you get puffiness, you get really bad breath. And I, I once caught an amoeba in Mexico, thank you very much. But the, they're not your friend. They are parasites. They're living inside your body, and they're going to make you their home until you kill them some way or another. There are uh, herbal detoxes for amoebas. I had a physician, uh, an osteopathic, a naturopathic physician, who had tried to get rid of her amoebas naturally and had never succeeded. I don't know how to get rid of them naturally, but I know that metronidazole, which is an antibiotic, will kill them. You've got to be careful with antibiotics because they also kill off your good bugs. And I don't mean that's that, – the bugs in our intestines are how we get rid of mercury. So if you take an antibiotic, you quit excreting mercury. So they're not benign substances, but on the other hand, neither are amoebas. So we like to, you know, uh, get rid of amoebas. And, um, and we, we also like to get rid of trichomonads. This is a, a one-celled animal that has three little feelers on the front, or another species has five little feelers, and we call them micromouse. That'll make your back crawl when you see that kind of stuff. But even this little stuff here, this, the little rods that are floating through here, those got to go too. Anything that moves. Now, plaque sits still on your teeth. You know, if you smile like this and all the stuff ran back and forth across your teeth, the people would back away from you, wouldn't they? Well, this stuff is living in the gums. This is, this is another amoeba, by the way. And, um, but snakes, you, they got some kind of agreement with this guy because you don't see them biting him. But on the next shot where you get a red blood cell, you can see one bite its way inside the red blood cell and crawl back out. So the, uh, what's inside him are the other uh, white blood cells he's eaten. So it's, it's basically a whole sensation of organisms and that everybody's different. Every smear is different. And, you know, this has got like four or five of the trichomonads. It's got the little gliding rod. It's got spirochetes. This is a white blood cell. It's a white blood cell. You can tell white blood cells that are alive because they boil. Sure. This is the juice from the bottom of the collar. And I'll tell you how, I'll tell you how I get the sample. Is it in the most gentle fashion, I take my Michigan periodontal program that I used to go around poking people's gums with, poking bacteria down deeper in the bone so that the gum disease went faster so I could extract more teeth. Well, I quit doing that because I decided it was inappropriate to take a wire and poke it in somebody's gum. But I still measure the gums, but after we disinfect it. So now if we accidentally poke a little too hard, we don't put bacteria down in there. We've cleaned it, so now we can disinfect it. But the Michigan probe, if you're not familiar, is a little skinny thing, a little teeny thing. And so what I do is I go in between the furthest posterior teeth because the, these are anaerobes. They can't stand oxygen. So that's why your front teeth go last, is you, unless you've got actinomyces acomatans can flip around the central incisors. But the, by putting a probe down the bottom gently, touch the tooth and lift it out, Trying not to knock any of this stuff off. I'm not looking for food. I'm not looking for plaque. I just lift it up, and I lay it in a drop of saliva on the slide and scrape it off. And I do it to, I do, I do the four corners. I go, I, four, I tell the, my assistant, 
four corners, and I get the posteriors on all four corners, and I pool the samples, put one on top of the other. Then I put a cover slip on it, and I take the handle of my mirror, and I get on top of it, and I start in a little circle, and I keep going around, 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 until that infinitesimal amount of stuff you got on the end of your probe. If you can see a glob of stuff on your probe, don't put it on the slide. It's too much. You need just a little teeny, teeny, tiny bit. And you put four little piles there, and you make a big... When you get all done, you'll have a, a circle, maybe bigger out of the dime. And then what you do is you, you zigzag through that circle, like they're looking for a, a, a crash site of an aircraft or something like that. You set up a grid and go through that entire slide in a matter of seconds. A lot of people are using a monitor to look at it. You only look, it's like looking through a straw, trying to see where the, where the dime is. You need to use the microscope eyepieces and zigzag through the whole thing. When you do, you'll find you've actually taken their, their Tulsa, instead of looking at the outback, now you're looking at their village. And so that's what you're seeing here. I want to go on and tell its own story. So you're looking at the village instead of just one little remote piece. And that's, that's why you have to screen that whole thing. And then you go down and you write down what you see. Because what, what I've seen is you'll see a bank of white blood cells. They fight like the Roman army. They get all side by side. They march together, and they all work through the area of infection. And what they do is they use selenium to spew out peroxide. Well, using peroxide in the mouth doesn't work for us because we're trying to get it from the top down. The white blood cell can do it because it can throw it right on the bacteria. But we do the top. We just make the gums foam. So you need some retentive antimicrobial to get rid of these guys. But when you see the Roman army marching through white blood cells, you know there's a war on because you don't get the Romans out there unless there's a war, right? And then there's a little area that's maybe you know, a zillionth of an inch wide where they're disinfecting in front of them. And then on the other side are this milieu of snakes and polywogs and frogs and all this other stuff that they're trying to kill. And what's interesting is that, is that if you go in with your, your Lugols or povidone iodine or chlorine and flush it all out and kill them, and you come back and look at it, in, in two to four weeks, the Roman army's gone. Because the war is over. All the bad guys died. And so they can go off and worry about something else. What happens at that point, over the next two or three years, all those holes in the bone and the puffy gums and all that stuff goes away, excuse me, and the gums get well and the loose teeth get solid. It's just, it's, a, it's an amazing thing to, to, get, to get to participate in. Um, the, the, one of the things that everybody uses as, 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 a, as a key is this thing here. This is a spirochete. It's like a little snake. It can bite with either end. And it, uh, it's, uh, uh, it, right here it's biting on, on what's left of a white blood cell. So they, the spirochetes are too smart. They actually counterattack. And so here the white blood cells are coming in, and so the, the spirochetes attack the white blood cell. That's too smart a bacteria. I don't think that. I don't like bacteria that smart. I want dumb bacteria. So the dumb bacteria is the scum on your teeth. That just takes sugar, turns it to acid, and your tooth falls apart. These guys are, are dissolving us. Uh, the, it took them until 68, I think it was, to actually grow spirochetes in culture because they can't stand oxygen and they eat blood. So they had to figure out what this guy would eat and live on. Well, where's he getting the blood? Oh, that would be you. So when we find bacteria in the bloodstream, we, and even atherosclerotic plaque, you cut it up, and there was a quick shot a minute ago about porphyrom. Porphyromonas gingivalis, that when they find atherosclerotic plaques and they cut them up, they find the DNA of the oral bacteria in the sclerotic plaque. Gee, you think maybe that getting bacteria in your bloodstream, they might find someplace else to live besides your bloodstream, like in your arteries and your valves and kidneys and so on? Yes, the answer to that is yes. It, it, all of those above. So, periodontal disease can cause health problems beyond the mouth, and they do it by extension, by bacteria getting suggests an increased risk of stroke and heart attack. Um, mothers that have periodontal disease are more likely to have a low birth weight baby, which is kind of a code word for a child that's not that smart. Um, difficult controlling blood sugar that's called diabetes. Come back here. Um, and uh, pancreatic and tongue cancers. Now, bacteria cause cancers? Yeah, because cancer is the result of inflammation. Bacteria cause inflammation. If you floss vigorously and your gums bleed, then you have inflammation. So anything that gets inflamed chronically is more likely to get a cancer than something that's not inflamed. So it's just some of the good things. And 
um, these are some slides that I made uh, a trip to the Museum of Man in San Diego and that uh, uh, Rose Tyson, the curator of physical anthropology, was kind enough to pull some boxes down from the shelves in her office. Wouldn't that be a nice office, have boxes with people in them? And uh, so she'd pull these down and, and she'd go through and tell me what her knowledge of anthropology would show. And, and A, you can look at the, the face of this as a North American Indian. It's got the nice uh, high cheekbone, square jaw, and uh, uh, no posterior teeth. You can see that all the, all the posterior teeth are gone on the upper, except for that one wisdom tooth that has no opponent. And uh, so terrible periodontal disease. And this is on an all-natural diet. So the people say, oh, I'm going to heal periodontal disease by giving them good food. Well, this guy never saw processed food, I can tell you, because they lived about 500 to 1,000 years ago in San Diego. They ate acorn. Acorn was the staple of their diet from the oak trees. So that's one of the reasons the teeth wore down. But he had periodontal disease. You can see how the bone has left the teeth. So you could put gums up around here. And those would measure out in six and seven millimeter pockets. And you'd say, well, I think we can fix that by doing a gum circumcision. No, you will just make it worse. You need to kill the germs. And, of course, the teeth wear down. And uh, the, the upper teeth are lost because the bone is uh, more porous. You have a sinus up there and it's weaker bone. So it's more likely to be lost. And so that's why, who was it, took a jawbone of an ass and beat somebody up with it? So here's a, here's a guy that's 90 years old. The only reason that tooth is in there is because it's welded to that tooth there with the, a with the little horseshoe. They used to have a plastic body on it, but that was lost 100 years ago. But this is the scummy stuff that causes cavities. It's not what causes gum disease. Um, I promise, watch that cell there. See the parakeet bites it, and it crawls inside, and you can see him bouncing around inside, and then and he bites his way back out. You don't want the parakeet. The, the little snake guys can bite with either end, and you see the other one chewing down here. And so they eat fibrin, and the, it's, uh, but it's the easiest one to kill. If, if my hygienist gives me back a patient that has even a few of those around, I send them back because they didn't do what I said. I mean, you, anybody can kill a spirochete. Spirochetes are pukey little things. They die quickly. So if they're still around after their initial new patient visit, you ain't done nothing for that patient. You know, you don't turn them loose until they're done. So, but I, the way I taught my hygienist to, to kill bugs was I always taught them to take samples at the end of their first appointment. I already knew what's in there. I had written it down on my chart. I said, just take a sample when you're done and show me if it's all clean. If it's not, treat them some more until it is. And uh, they figured it out, and they were shocked. We, we did find that uh, chloramine P, one of the, one of the disinfecting agents, um, is light sensitive, and I hadn't realized that, but uh, it had sat out on the counter instead of under a, under a sink, and it wasn't killing bugs. And she said, I can't get them to die. <laughs> well, let's make up some new. Um, root canals are another subject that we covered another day, but dead teeth are dead teeth. They belong in dead people. Um, the, the body has a way of dealing with slow attrition, and these canals are all blocked off. And that's because those teeth wore down over a period of 40 years, and the body just kept putting more dentin around them. So those are healthy teeth, not healthy teeth. And stone ground flour chewed up, or stone ground acorns, wears teeth out. Um, <clears throat> you could also wear into the nerve on the tooth, and then it would form an abscess. Now, that's different than periodontal disease. You can get what are called endoperio lesions, where you have periodontal disease and a dead tooth working together to make a big hole. That's a different deal. If you take the tooth out then, and treat the periodontal disease, you get save the rest of them. I look at it like a war. You know, you can't be crying about Sergeant Ryan because, you know, you got to go ahead and fight the war until you win the war. And so just because a soldier dies here and a soldier dies there, God gave you 32 teeth. You may screw up and lose one here and there. Fine. Deal with it, but let's save the rest of the troops. Just because one died, there's no reason to give up. And then don't have them embalmed and drag them along with you either. So, so yeah. Here's a 21-year-old guy. who's the youngest uh, skull and that uh, she showed me in her uh, tour of her office. And that uh, he had, uh, uh, again, a North American Indian. And, and then she said uh, he was a girl and because uh, the femur was only about that long. She said, this will make a little short guy. And uh, 
And they said, well, what's that awful ugly girl? And, um, and so she looked again and looked at the pelvis, and she said, no, it's a, it's a, it's a guy, but it's, uh, he's been sick all his life um, since about age 12. And you look at his teeth, and you see that one side is completely worn out, clear into the base of the tooth there, and very little wear on the other side. And, and the, we got to talking about it, and you see that this fits opposite the really worn side. You get to talking about it, and, and she wasn't sure what had happened to him, but she looked at his bones, and what happens is he had healthy bone and sick bone, healthy bone, sick bone, healthy bone. She said he was injured. Something happened when he was around 12, and then he lived for about another nine years. She could tell by the sutures in the head that you seal off. And so I looked at it, and you can see that that's a nice big abscess tooth. That wouldn't feel good to bite on. And um, looked at his TMJ, and I asked her, how come the bone is white there? And she said, oh, because the jaw was fused to the skull, and we had to break it to get it loose. But it wasn't broken on the other side. That he'd injured this TMJ when he was 12, and the jaw had healed as a solid joint, so the joint no longer moved. And then he could only eat by gnawing and actually bending the bone. And so when that tooth abscessed, he could no longer chew and starve to death. So, and she said, that makes sense to me. And here in the next box I looked at was this fella who uh, you can see how shiny the teeth are. And in those other slides, I wasn't showing you shiny teeth. And I said, did you clean this guy's teeth or something? She said, no, this is, we wrote the number on the job, and we didn't, we didn't clean these up at all. And I said, well, he's certainly uh, shiny. And I said, what's, what's this hole here? And she said, oh, he was, a, he was either a maker of arrows or a basket weaver. And that's where he bit the leather. Or the, and I said, I'd vote for basket weaver because I said that he was biting the reed to make the basket, and he was picking at his lower teeth because business was slow. She said, you could look at his bones. He, he, he folded him. He, he, he worked in a squatting position, and his bones fit perfectly in a squatting position. Our bones are still talking to us, even years after we're gone. And uh, in there, uh, you see that the posterior teeth have been lost in some places. If he'd had a crooked stick, he could have saved those. Look at the ring of tartar. He's got rings of tartar around his teeth, but still, they're reasonably healthy. Tartar does not cause gum disease. Um, guys did a thing where he would uh, polish, it, polish it down so it wasn't rough and, and sterilize it and then measure the, and record the recovery of the gum. Tartar does not cause gum disease. It is condominium for the bacteria, so it's a place for them to hang out. So it's nice for it to come off. But what happens is once you get the gums well, this tartar is sitting up above the gum. The idiot can knock that off with the Cavitron in 60 seconds. That's why I like to do it, because it makes life a lot easier. And this, this is San Diego's claim to fame. That's Del Mar Man 5,000 years ago. It's up where the racetrack is. But I'm not telling you anything new. I'm just applying it differently. And W.D. Miller uh, uh, graduated uh, from my grandfather's dental school, but uh, quite a bit earlier than my grandfather. And uh, he's been called the father of modern dentistry. And then C.C. Bass was the guy that taught us to floss. He also identified the amoeba, uh, clear back in 19, 1919, I think, is when he wrote about the amoeba as a, as a pathological entity in gum disease. So how many people in their practice focus on the amoeba in treating gum disease? You're not listening. So anyway, um, Paul Kais is the fellow that identified numerous microorganisms uh, as causing gum disease. He wasn't particularly concerned about the amoeba. And then Bob Barkley was the, my mentor who came to talk to my dental school in 1969, and, or 68, actually, and, uh, and got the, the senior dental students so critical. Oh, darn, they figured out how to stop dental disease. And the juniors, how come I haven't heard this before? So those are the people that basically have moved dentistry forward. Um, University of Pennsylvania, uh, where Granddad went to dental school, they, they taught Granddad how to extract teeth. <laughs> he was real good at it, but that was about all they knew about it in the, in the 1800s. And, um, but uh, Miller uh, worked uh, with Robert Koch and uh, Koch's postulates, you know, bacteria and that sort of stuff. And, uh, and he wrote the uh, microorganisms in the human mouth. And he didn't know what we know now because they couldn't grow lots of these guys. But they, he basically talked about microorganisms being the fundamental cause of tooth decay and gum disease. And that had to be before 1907 because he died in 1907. So. And then I talked about uh, Charles Bass and, and the 
Dr. Bass, the, the, his dentist wanted to take all his teeth out because this is back in the, in the, in the early 30s. That they had determined in the 30s that having bad teeth meant you were likely to have a heart attack and heart disease. And so they said, well, Dr. Bass, you've got gum disease. You should have all your teeth pulled. And uh, what's interesting is that was my grandfather's solution to gum disease because he was an extractionist. And so he had a little gum disease, so he got all his teeth pulled. And I, I think it killed him. He only lived to be 93. So maybe, maybe they were right about that, helping to live longer. My dad's 99, but we worked real hard to keep his teeth. But um, he figured out the bass technique of brushing by brushing his own mouth with an Oral-B or a Braun or whatever he had and figuring out that they didn't get the bugs off his teeth. And so then he kept screwing around with an ordinary toothbrush and he take his pliers and pull a bunch of the bristles out and he worked this way and he pulled the pliers and worked that way and he figured out that if you if you pull the bristles out so that they have very few bristles it's like the, the getting a job at the circus lying on the bed of nails if you only got one nail on the bed you're not going to like that job so the idea is you pull the bristles out in a fashion that you have three rows but they're staggered they're not they're parallel front to back, but not side to side. And what that allows for the brush to do is to go much deeper into your gums than ordinary. So these are these are gum brushing brushes. And I'm going to ask my friend Wayne King to come up and give me a hand. Because I've got another group to talk to. But I brought a whole bag of bass brushes. And I found if I just send the bag out, they all go. <laughs> come on, Wayne. The, uh, Everybody should get a bass brush. One per family, please. The, uh, put in your work, Wayne. Wayne has got more courage than any three people should ever have. He, half a century ago, he was putting ads in journals and places like that, give, giving a real hard time to everybody about mercury. And so I said one of the reasons we've had such a long, intractable fight on this issue is because of a shortage of courage. Because if you know that there's something wrong, and you don't stand up and say, there's something wrong, I'm concerned about that, then that's a deficiency of courage. We have the knowledge, but what we need are people with courage. And they say, oh, well, I might get attacked. I might get called a bad name. And I've been doing this for 30 years. And they are afraid to end up in a face-to-face -face discussion because they know they don't know anything. They know they're making it up. That's why no one has ever challenged me. And that's simply because I don't say that getting bad bugs out of your gums will do anything besides get rid of the bad bugs. Make your gum disease go away. Get rid of mercury will lower your daily intake of mercury. So Paul Kais, researcher at the NIDR, identified strep mutans. Now, why don't we use strep mutans as a barometer of caries in children? So that any time a two-year-old child came in your practice and um, sat in your chair and the mother says, this is the first, first dental visit, and he says, does your child know how to spit? Oh, yeah, I think so. Okay, spit in the tube here, and we'll see if he is at risk of tooth decay. It's that simple. You don't have to pry open the mouth or anything like that. You can just say, spit in the tube. 48 hours, I'll know whether strep mutans is present. What's the matter that? Are we now? How many people are measuring on a routine basis the presence of strep mutans and quantities in the mouth? I see we've got a ways to go, because that becomes a magnet for mothers with children. There, my child's 18 months and he can spit. Let's see if he's got the bugs. The word travels fast. If you know how to stop a disease, they're going to come see you. So. The therapy is real simple. Identify the cause. Well, we talked about that. Strep mutans and the wiggly squiggly things. Treat the cause. Kill the wiggly squiggly things. Teach the patient to kill the wiggly squiggly things at home. And then have them come back fairly often so that we can see if the wiggly squiggly things have come back. And you might be surprised how the wiggly squiggly things come back. And that's, that's some of the fun stuff. Um, Lots of things kill bacteria. 
Salt water, for example, will do just fine. The easy way to use it is to have it already made up so you can easily pour some into the irrigator and squirt away. Here's my simple recipe for oral health. First you take one large mason jar. Glass is best, but plastic will do. Then add one inch of salt and one inch of baking soda. Now pour in enough hot water to fill up the jar and then mix it. Now set it under the sink and let all that unused salt and soda sink to the bottom before you use it. Grit in your irrigating solution will plug your water irrigator. So let the grit settle out. Next, you can begin your normal oral hygiene procedures such as flossing, toothbrushing with the bass brush, toothpicking, to stir up the gooey bacteria that grows on the teeth and clogs up the gums. Once the grit has settled to the bottom, you've made what's called a saturated salt solution. But it's really too strong. So now you can dilute it 50-50 with warm water and the temperature will be just perfect. You can add a splash of iodine if you like, but now you're ready to irrigate. Check the power setting to make sure it's on low and you're going to use the big tip which you can point in between your teeth one at a time all around your mouth first outside and then inside. The reason you're using the low setting is that you're not doing a car wash. You do not need to blast these bacteria off your teeth and just as we showed you in the earlier part you can blast them into your bloodstream too. You don't want to do that. You just want to rinse them away gently with a good firm stream of water. Once you've finished with the irrigator, you need to rinse out the irrigator or it won't run next time. Salt will plug it up. So, all you got to do is run some fresh water through the irrigator before you put it away. So, that's on YouTube. That's called the uh, um, Recipe for Oral Health. And people blog on there and ask questions and please do. You know, the uh, there's a that's just one method. Um, I've been uh, lecturing at the Gerson Institute uh, a couple times a year, and uh, because the Max Gerson was down on anything with sodium, uh, I said, well, you know, salt, it's a metal hooked to an inorganic molecule, so you can make it out of potassium, you can make it out of magnesium sulfate, you can, you can use any kind of small inorganic molecule hooked to a metal, and uh, that bacteria don't have skin. We can go swimming in the ocean, and we don't shrivel up and die. And bacteria do. So any kind of inorganic salt is going to be perfectly acceptable. And so Dr. Gersten had uh, his clients using three different uh, uh, potassiums, potassium acetate. Um, they didn't use the chloride. They used, I, I don't remember the uh, potassium sulfate. I think they had three different potassiums. So I simply made the solution up with the, with the, the ingredients of the uh, Gersten therapy. And for those that didn't know, Gerson, Dr. Gerson wrote the book 50 Incurables Cured in 1957, and he treated 50 cases of widely disseminated metastatic cancer nutritionally with uh, coffee enemas, uh, seven green, seven yellow juices, and quantities of potassium, along with uh, iodine, Lugol, and uh, uh, other interventions, including liver uh, extract, and that program still exists to this day and they have a very good success rate in treating cancers nutritionally. So um, who knew you could do that? Well, you can cause it nutritionally. Maybe you can make it go away nutritionally. What do you think? So the diagnostic analysis starts with a microscope. And I know some people that are concerned about you know, the cost of a microscope. And you know, you can get them on the internet used for you know, 500 bucks, and then you spend another thousand to get them fixed, or you can buy a new one for 1,500. The, um, but without a microscope, you're flying blind. And I just, I just flew with Betty here for over two days through lots of clouds, and I can tell you, I really like being able to see the rolling map of the GPS with the, with the cell phone towers and all that stuff in the way. And the same is true of you and your practice: is that if you got a microscope, your hygienist knows, you know. Everybody, the dental, my dental assistant would take the sample as soon as I got it made, and I'm sitting there, I'm a little too gabby, I was talking to the patient, she'd snatch it and go over and say, <laughs> 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 it just doesn't take a rocket scientist 
If it moves, kill it. It's real simple. So, so that's where it starts. You figure out what's in there. After you've disinfected the gums, measure them. Standard of care, measure the gums. After you've disinfected them, and then you've got a written record of where they started. This will save you a gajillion dollars in malpractice. Siri Baskar, the head, a former head of the U.S. Army Pathology Division, retired and became a, pathologi a, a periodontologist in Monterey, and his fellow practitioners cooked up a lawsuit against Dr. Baskar for not cutting enough gums off, and he won. They were not successful because there is no rule that says you've got to treat a disease this way or that way. You've got to keep records of how you treat the disease and what it started with and what you did to make it go differently. And that's what Dr. Baskar did. He identified the organisms and killed them. And that made his surgically oriented friends enemies. Maybe they were the senior dental student who was sitting on my right. You know? it might, it might have been him. Okay. Could have been. So you can figure out mo visual odors, color, smell, mobility, uh, pain, heat, redness, and swelling. All those things are really easy for you to figure out, but they're not nearly as accurate as a sample in the bugs. Look at it. Just crawl and kill it. Because I had a very beautiful, um, though thoroughly infected, um, attorney, um, patient of mine. And... Uh, she came in, and uh, uh, somebody in the office had said, well, that, that Dan Kennedy knows how to stop this disease. And she'd had surgery twice at t age 29. And she was advancing rapidly. And uh, she was, didn't have the amoeba. It's all spirochetes. And uh, so we treated her. Spirochetes went away, and her breath was fresh for the first time in 30 years. And 29. She was 29 years old. And, uh, and she was waxing enthusiastic on her on her final checkup and, and uh, she said could i have infected my child she understood at this point that gum disease is an infectious it goes from mothers and lovers and, and uh, also dogs and she uh and i said oh no those little children they're so robust and energetic and they think probably do and i don't think you could if, if, if. she said, could you look and he says is he here and she <laughs> brought in her five-year-old son full of spirochetes just completely full of spirochetes and we treated him one time he never had another spirochete. Where do you think he got a spirochete? If I had DNA, I bet his mom. But we killed him, and they didn't come back. So mothers, lovers, and dogs. Thanks, Mom. But uh, so you've got to have a microscope. It's required, and, and it costs less than your, your high-speed drill. So, you know, one-fifth of our income in our practice came from preventive dentistry. And that's the bug check and the treatment and all this other stuff, but one, one fifth. And so you're spending 90% of your money on machines to mill inlays or dental chairs and all this other stuff, and that doesn't make money for you. Is it having people know that they can find a solution to a lifelong problem in a matter of weeks makes money for you? It makes you the magnet. And you don't have to go out and advertise that you can save the world. They'll tell each other. I didn't tell that attorney to come see me. The senior manager of the office told him. So, and so you've seen that slide. We call it a tricky nomad. And so these are uh, the kind of things that you look at. Uh, you know, I had, had one, one guy uh, with a quadriplegic. He rolled his car when he was 17. The, it's at age 17, a mother is more likely to lose her child, especially if it's a boy, from auto accidents than cancer. But that's terrible. I mean, you know, at the turn of the century, less than 1% of the people in the died of cancer. And now it's half of us. Something's really happened in the last 100 years. I'm telling you. Anyway, he broke his neck. And um, he smelled so bad that the caregivers that plug his tubes together and all that stuff didn't want to get close to him because he smelled bad and then the VA wanted to pull his teeth out because you know that when you touch the gums pus came spewing from the gums I've never seen anybody that had uh, 32 teeth with pus coming from every single tooth I've never seen it and I took x-rays 
and you could not find 10 teeth that had two millimeters of bone. And some teeth that the bone was actually below the apex of the tooth. And I just told him, I said, oh, it's really bad. I'm sorry, you know, can't do anything about it. And he said, well, you know, the VA told me that if I didn't get my teeth out, I was going to die. And I told him, I'm not going to remove my teeth because it's the only thing I can turn the page in a book with. I can bite a pencil and turn a page. And uh, I said, well, you know, sorry to hear that, but, you know, this is so advanced, I don't really know that anything I can do. And he says, well, give it a try. <laughs> so we saw him six times, and, and then I never saw him again for seven years. And he came back in and, hello? And he, came, he came back in and after seven years, and he didn't have any bugs because we disinfected him. And then he said, and I'm not swapping spit with anybody. It's an organism that you don't have in your body when you're born, and you can kill it, and it's not back again until you find a new lover. So the wet sample technique I described, uh, anaerobic culture is extremely difficult. It's only a research tool. Um, Carrie's check on the bottom is, um, um, I think Vivadent sells it. It's uh, a series of test tubes in an incubator. You know, it's very cheap, very simple, and all of a sudden now, you can tell the mother of the two-year-old child or the 80-year-old person whether or not they are at risk of tooth decay. Instead of saying, taking a, a wire and poking the tooth to see if there are any soft spots, well, that's pretty blunt. Why don't we look and see if there's a fire before we, and we can know that we need to call a fireman? So medical referrals, I was talking about this during the break, that everyone needs a team of people around them, which will not only grow your practice, but it also takes the responsibility off of you for knowing everything there is to know about everything. Is you can't be an expert in all fields. Nutrition, for example. It takes hours and hours and hours of work nutritionally to get people to modify behaviors. I'm, I'm down to five? 15, okay. Uh, to modify your behavior and get to the point where they actually have you know, improved nutritional status. However, all of us admit that that's an important thing. So why don't we have a nutritionist that we work with? So go into your community, seek out nutritionists, and ask them if they'd like to work with a dentist. Your chiropractors already know fluoride and mercury are bad. They also are happy to help with many of the other aspects of detox. And so if you don't have a nutritionist, many chiropractors teach nutrition in their practice too. And the internist that is knowledgeable on allergies and mercury issues will be glad to work with you. So build your referral system and let them do the medical tests and balance the, the chemistry of the body. You can have huge amounts of healing all over from all of these things. There's nothing wrong with doing any of them in your practice, but you know, you can't be all things to all people. So use your team and what you'll find is they have questions for you too. That you don't just send patients one way, they send them back the other way and they say, I got this patient, could this be the problem? And you end up finding gum disease and dead teeth and all that stuff. Um, you know, this is pretty standard stuff. You, you learned this in school. It's, it's still true. But what's the treatment is disinfection and teaching the patient to maintain it at home and looking fairly often. And that, that's um, fluoride and OSHA. Huh? The, uh, the, uh, one of the things that uh, we're going to talk about this weekend is you can't legally open the amalgam capsule. So that's, that's why I broke away to do that. So one of the things that I want to kind of sum up here is, is that the attitude is that if you're instructing your patient how to floss and brush with a wagging finger, uh, was it uh, uh, John Stewart's friend, uh, wagging finger, is that if you, if, if you go a cold bear with the wagging finger, is that people are going to turn off to you, that that's not the relationship that you should have with the patient. That is... The na 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 relationship. That is the I know more than you do relationship. And it's got the, the anger in the voice, the push, 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 do what I say, do what I say. And that's not going to get you compliance. On the other hand, the open hand, how can I help you? No fault attitude. If they come back infected, ah, I can see we have a recurrence of our little friends. And uh, one lady I asked, I 
I said, uh, does your husband have gum disease? He said, oh, he died long ago. And I said, oh. He said, you got a new lover? And uh, she said, no, no, just, just me. And I said, you got a dog? Oh, little Pookie. And I said, little Pookie is just kissing the face. And she said, oh, he's just kissing. And I said, well, you know what he uses for toilet paper? So anyway, the... Uh, so that's what the second line is. Look for the source of reinfection. Mothers, lovers, and dogs. They've actually got DNA testing proving it comes from dogs. So, but not necessarily from cats. Cats, you get a, a parasite. It's something toxoplasmosis goes out. Anyway, so um, always praise. Even if they're only making a minimal effort, praise. And then monitor everything with your microscope and your strep mutans. Um, if blood comes out, bacteria will go in. Teach them that if they take this soft toothbrush and push with all their effort, consistently and hard, if there's any red on the toothbrush, they've got gum disease. Because I can brush my hand and I don't get any blood on my brush. If it, there's blood on the brush, you've got a hole in your gum. And I know why it's there. The bugs ate the hole. Kill them. If the blood comes out, the bacteria will go in, and they're going to cause heart infections and low birth weight babies and diabetes, pancreatic cancer, and a few other things. So let's, let's just avoid those. Those, don't, those aren't any fun. And poor old San Diego has been beset with fluoridation, and you might hear some more about this this weekend, that we're doing our very best to turn this around. And uh, in this... I'm, I think I'm going to show you the the video. This is this is the last thing I'm going to show you. This after I heard about amoebas, I went home and when I first pulled out my microscope, took a sample and looked. This is the video. How come you don't play it? Let's see if it'll play. No, maybe I won't play it for you. Yeah, it's playing. Oh, I turned it off. Defense system. It's a neutrophil with a multi-segmented nucleus. The cytoplasm of the white blood cell appears to effervesce or boil. That characteristic distinguishes the white blood cell from the really bad actors, amoebas. In this smear, there's an army of white blood cells forming a barrier. White blood cells always work together to try to protect you, but they're helpless against the amoeba. This is a large amoeba. It is a one-celled animal and a parasite. It's often found in severe periodontal infections. It's about to give birth. This is the nucleus. The white spot is called a vacuole. The cytoplasm does not effervesce. They move by what's called a pseudopod, or in other words, this blob bulges out in one direction or another, and it slinks that direction. This one will take a nucleus and a cytoplasm and make a whole new amoeba. This is the only video I've seen of an amoeba giving birth. <laughs> there you are. Now you've seen a an amoeba giving birth. So the uh, Trevor Lyons showed this amoeba process, and they all get together before they do that and rub around on each other, and then they give birth. So is it asexual, or is it good times are had by all? Spirochetes are virulent yeah, bacteria. This, this thing. So I thank you for your attention, and uh, we've got uh, a whole convention here to pay attention to and, and enjoy. And uh, I have a, a few minutes here to answer a question or two, and uh, we'll, uh, I got 30 minutes? Oh, well, I, I'll talk about faster. No, I get, but I get plenty of time to answer questions. And, uh, and if I run out of questions, I'll go find another slide or two. You know, uh, probably an excellent idea, but you know, the, the bugs that are in your um, gingival sulcus are not in your saliva. 
and the, actually the bugs on your tongue are not the same as your gingival sulcus. If you want to do that one, um, that you know that actually would be a good adjunct to your microscope. Uh, but I would, uh, I'd cheat. I wouldn't use spit. I would use. I would go in the back into the posterior teeth, doing my four corners. I'd put that as my DNA test, and that would be the cat's meow. What did I use to disinfect before probing is that in my uh, ignorance, in the early days I used chloramine tea, and that's chlorine with an ammonia group on one end, and it will kill doo-doo. So it works wonderfully, but you know, you know, we're concerned about cancer and stuff like that. Chlorine in the drinking water is why you see the huge increase in breast cancer. Uh, the, and so what could we use instead? Oh, well, how about iodine with ammonia on it. That would be povidone iodine or one of the uh, zinc chloride, which is a, uh, yet another one that's found in scope. There are lots of different ingredients you can use, and I would probably move away from the chloride and toward the iodines and, uh, and, and use those as a disinfectant. Why? Because she's asking about instant disinfection as opposed to uh, maintenance at home. Chronic maintenance at home versus you need something that is uh, hugely antibacterial in a very short amount of time, and that would be your povidone iodine, and, or even Lugol. Lugol will kill it pretty quick. And Wayne's got a micro, microphone he's running around with now. Well, I've got one over here, okay, but uh, I'm curious about the quadriplegic. Uh, what's the rest of the story? When he came back, what had happened to his bone? What happened to his teeth? Well, all of his teeth are solid. Uh, bone had grown up. I only took three x-rays or something like that because he couldn't afford anything, so I did. And, uh, but he had, uh, on his lower anterior teeth, where the bone has actually been about two millimeters below them, uh, had, had actually crawled up with like ivy, and it, it had a hold of the bottom oh, millimeter and a half of the two. And uh, he had no, uh, no, no uh, bad bugs of any kind. It was, it was completely, I took eight, eight samples from every conceivable corner and still got pockets. Uh, there was no pus and no bleeding on probing. And so I didn't have any any concern at all about you know taking samples because he did his gums were like tough as nails and pink and he didn't have any any sign of his earlier periodontalities. His teeth, because they were so loose, had drifted out, and so they were apart like that. And I asked him if he wanted to pull them back together. He says, "I don't want to touch them." <laughs> so I'm, I'm happy to turn the pages of my book. <laughs> so so his, his he recovered as completely as you possibly can from horrible bone loss. He, he still has 32 teeth. I didn't take any teeth out. And, um, and he has adequate bone for the teeth to be solid. And I was surprised, even like a lower anterior tooth with a you know, millimeter or two of bone, I, I could have taken every tooth in his head out with my fingers when he came in. And now they're solid enough, I'd have to use a pair of pliers. You know, it's like syphilis, that there are studies of syphilis now uh, from the Tuskegee, uh, Alabama experiments, but they're considered highly unethical. So I don't know how you would design an experiment that had an adequate control um, because you'd have to leave somebody infected, and I don't, I don't think you're going to ever get that kind of experiment. However, uh, as far as research goes, the research uh, as to the cost of organisms of paranology <coughs> goes back almost 100 years. And the Ramford studies, uh, which were uh, where they did surgery on a quarter of the mouth on one side and a quarter mouth on the other, and they figured out they're right-handers, left-handed, and they switched it around. And those studies are 30 years old now. And they showed that their uh, surgery uh, treated side accelerated the, the disease. So in terms of the study you're looking for, there are studies showing that what we're doing is wrong accelerates the disease, but I don't know that there are any studies that I could point to because basically they would be unethical. That disinfecting mouths is a, a good idea. I would never have guaranteed to that young man that I was, he was going to have that kind of outcome because that's blew me away. I'm surprised, but you know, it's that, that's the limitation. And what you need to understand is in clinical practice, that 
percent of medicine has no scientific basis. It's theoretical basis. And so, you know, you come in with a cold, and the physician tries to determine whether that cold is viral or bacterial, and then uh, choose an appropriate treatment. That's based upon seat of the pants medicine. You know, that's not based upon a scientific study of treating 200 patients with cold, 100 got IV vitamin C, and the other 100 got water. But I can tell you, if you want to make a cold go away, get a good load of IV vitamin C, and it'll go away if you start early enough. I got a question about uh, if, if the bone came back, would it be ankylosed? I mean, would you recreate the periodontal me membrane? Would you? You know, would, um, what would the occlusion be on that? I mean, because well, he was, he was, like I said, he, he had flared anterior issues. You've, you've seen advanced periodontal disease. He had flared anterior issues. He had, had posterior occlusion. And uh, no, they were not ankylosed because I could I could wiggle. And so I think the body regenerated the, the or, or perhaps it was still there. You know it. it the bone may have been there in, in a fragmentary fashion, and the body just fills in the missing parts. I think that's more, rather than saying that bone can grow up a tooth like ivy, I don't know, but you know, pretty, pretty radiolucent around the apex of a lot of teeth. When you talk about flaring anteriors, obviously that's from the component of force, the teeth, the tongue, the whole function. So now you have like very loose teeth. I just don't see how they would stay in position for the bone to grow back. But, you know, I'm a new member here. I mean, I just. It is. I think, I think it has to go. It is what it is. <laughs> the, uh, so I, I haven't seen him for seven. I've only seen this guy seven times. I saw him his six treatment times, missed him for seven years, and I saw him one more time just for a bug check. He's poor. Break your neck, you don't have any money. So his parent paid for the treatment, and he paid, and he paid for a bug check. But, it, it, so it is what it is, and, and but it certainly blew my socks off. So it, but you know, it, it it's not surprising in that I practiced with the microscope for um, 25 years in clinical practice. It it's predictable. It, periodontal disease is the most predictable disease to treat. If you can get it to the point where you don't have crawling, they're going to get well every time, without without fail for 25 years. I can tell you that was the predictable outcome of disinfecting the mouth. And, you know, uh, if you talk to a doctor that, that was treating infected thumbs, you said, you know, if you could get that infection in the thumb to go away, they would be able to keep their thumb. It's not, it's an infection. It's, and it's no different than every other infection you ever knew. Somehow, because of all of our training, we get all involved in tartar and occlusion and this and this and this. It's a bug. Kill the bug. Now it's getting well. It's coming to you. How about, how about the good bacteria? You know, when you're looking at the uh, slide and there's a lot of cocci and rods, you know, and, and some of those are good. I mean, obviously, spirochetes we know are bad. So where do you draw the line as to, you know, to really be able to learn how to read the slide? Well, I have to, I have to quote General uh, Patton. He said, kill them all and let God sort them out. But I've never seen a mouse that didn't have, you know, some black in it, but the good bugs move. I mean, the good bugs don't move, and the bad bugs do. There is one bad bug that doesn't move. It's called actinomycin jaconitin, and it causes massive bone loss on first molars and centrals, and it's linked to a whole host of things. But that's the only vegetative bacteria that I'm aware of that doesn't move. So it's it's not possible, I don't think. It, it's like, you know, like skin. Is it, you, you can't technically disinfect skin. Is it that you could, you could scrub it down to the point where you can take a knife and cut through and so forth. But if you ever watch what they do in surgery, they'll clip that skin and fold it back this way so that the skin is not in the surgical site because the skin, even though it's been disinfected, it's not, they're not going to let that skin get into the surgical site if they can help it. Since spirochetes, amoebas, trichomonads, gliding rods, small, small gliding rods, spinning rods, those are the chief culprits are pathogenic organisms. They're not, they're not part of our normal flora. They are in pathogens that are invaded from mothers, lovers, and dogs. Killing them is actually fairly uh, easy. The, they're uh, anaerobes. They can't stand oxygen, so we can use oxygen against them. They're not, uh, they're not a robust organism. They basically are looking to get inside us 
so that they don't have to deal with the environment. They're not a robust organism. Spirochetes, you'll kill them taking the sample. Lift that sample out of the gum, come over here, put it on the slide, put it on, smash it on the slide, look at it, and you can look at it for a half hour. And after 45 minutes, half of them are dead. You know, after an hour, all of them are dead. Well, why? They can't stand it out here in the world. On the other hand, the normal flora that are in our gut, in our mouth, and so forth, they're, they're tough little boogers. And then if you keep killing them with antibiotics, they would survive well. So you can repopulate. There's actually probiotics for the mouth that you can repopulate the mouth with probiotics, which is not a bad idea. You know, I definitely encourage everybody to have an antibiotic ever to repopulate their gut with good, good probiotics because you're, you're not getting all the nutrients out of your food that you should if you've killed off your good you know, flora. And the example I give people is this, is that if you had a beautiful yard, wonderful compact Bermuda grass, it was just beautiful, you could you play tennis on it, it was just super, and I came up with my Agent Orange, that you can get at Home Depot now, it's called Roundup, and I killed that yard, what's going to grow back? Bermuda grass? Weeds. And that's what happens to our intestines, is that we take, we have a cold, we go to the doctor, and he gives you, you know, the vancomycin or something. And it, you kill off all your good bugs along with your bad bugs. Well, good, you're still alive. Okay, that's nice. You didn't die of pneumonia. But if you don't put good bugs back in you, you grow back weeds. Now, the mouth may or may not be different. And because we're not using an antibiotic generally, we're using a topical application of, of stuff that kills on contact. We don't do the tongue and we don't do the cheeks. And so the population is going to survive that normally populate the mouth. I've never had a situation where I thought the mouth needed needed uh, um, anything other than kill the bad bugs and, and let the good bugs survive or use probiotics. There are probiotics for the mouth. Same and as the gut. What are those those probiotics that you, we use in the mouth? I haven't read the, I haven't read the label. Okay. I was <laughs> after I retired. So I All should right. go read the label. I, I have another question. How about the use of lasers, you know, to disinfect? You know, there are some laser protocols, you know, Sort of using lower powers that are uh, that you know if you run it completely in every sulcus around every tooth that you're doing a, a good disinfection. What's your feeling on that? Uh, I think where you can reach with the laser probably does a good job. The trouble I think with it, and, and it's not not necessarily a criticism of the laser. The trouble is the laser is a straight line. So if if I gave you a, a straight line and I said touch every part of the, the sulcus with a straight line, you're going to say well you know I can get it, but you know I, I got the I got the indentation here for the for the roots, you know, I'm down into the perca here, and I got, I got the, you know, the, the trifurcation area on the upper teeth that I've got to get into, and I can't get there with a straight line. So frying the bacteria over here is not going to affect them over here, and that's the thing you got to understand. Get down on the microcosm of the bacteria; they're everywhere. And so if you fry them here and you don't fry them here, they're going to move back over here along. So it's 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 also the reason why uh, periodontal surgery uh, fails so often if they don't. If they don't kill the bugs, I mean, parallel surgery works fine. You kill the bugs first because that's all you need to do. But they do it an area at a time, and so this area reinfects that area, and that's that's the trouble. With the, of, that's the biggest problem I see with the laser is it, is getting it into the nooks and crannies. Although you know if you got one, use it and then flush it out when you're done. Could could give you a leg up on getting it done. Does it, does it bother the uh, t soft tissue at all? Does it burn the soft tissue, or is it just set to the frequency of bacteria? Depends on the wavelength of the laser, and in, in, there's actually a biosimulatory effect where the light is taken up by the uh, the good cells and actually uh, goes towards uh, healing, helps you know healing in the uh, adjacent areas. So, yeah, I'm, I'm all in favor of things that help healing, and, and as, long, as long as it doesn't damage the tissue. That's, that's it's like remember when we were in dental school, we were taught to um, uh, what was it called, uh, curatage and uh, deep scaling curatage with curatage, where they actually put, touch it with your finger here and, and hold the tissue and scrape all the skin off the inside of the tissue. Um, a useless uh, endeavor, uh, does no good whatsoever. Um, if you disinfect the gums and, and try real hard not to touch the tissues, that's my protocol. That, that's the IMC protocol. You get rid of the organisms, leave the tissue alone, and just like our quadriplegic, you know, the, the body knows how to fix stuff that you and I can't. And how important is uh, cleaning the root surface? Not. Paul Kais had a slide that he used to show of epithelium attached to tartar. So all the stuff we've heard about how tartar is causing gum disease, that's not correct. It's bacteria in the tartar are causing the gum disease. And so 
what will happen is that if it's, if it's a, what will happen is that if it's a, a problem, I'm not holding Turner up. I'm not, a, I'm not a fan of leaving Turner behind, but I also know, having had my period when I used to do surgery and flap them, that we can scale to her blue in the face. We're not going to get on one hers. <laughs> Peel them back and think, hmm, and I did this on myself. So anyway, you can leave the tartar, and if it's a problem, you will find that as you do your annual checkup, you will find an area that maybe doesn't didn't heal like the rest of them. Or I, I went one time had a guy I had to take a the tartar was stuck on his teeth so hard that I ended up using a diamond, and I just took a diamond and polished it down. It got well, but you know, when you got to use a diamond to grind the tartar off the tooth, that stuff's pretty hard. But that was a that was one 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 root out of you know. 32 teeth, so. But it wouldn't heal. Right? <laughs> Got well. We'll grind it off if we can't get rid of it. Laid by your wings. Uh, actually, I've, I've got a question here, if that's right. Oh, okay, sure. sure. Yeah. Um, I was just wondering uh, what are your thoughts on uh, ozonated water and ozone gas as a, as a disinfectant? Well, the question earlier was about the you know, peer reviewed side of the evidence showing that. You know, parallel disease, would, you could cure it by killing the bugs. Don't got that. Got a ton of scientific evidence that ozone, ozonated water does a wonderful job of killing germs. So, you know, that's, uh, you know, in, in the in the sulcus, in the, uh, in the irrigator, in the, uh, in the, in the sulcus. The biggest thing is delivering it and that the, I didn't show you a slide of it, but there's a thing called a cannula. I think you need to use a cannula and either, either as a carrier in a, uh, in the water, Aqueous is, is a good way, but there also you can ozonate oils, and the oil itself actually kills bacteria too. So you can have ozonated oil or ozonated water and deliver it to the sulcus, and there's lots of research showing that ozone is Machine cost you, Joe? Uh, about six thousand. So, so your microscope fifteen hundred, and your ozone machine. But you already got the ozone machine. So get the microscope so you can see if you've done any good. Yes, Dr. Kennedy. Um, what are your thoughts about sterilizing cavity preparations with Lugols? And is there any possibility of hurting the patient by doing that? Uh, no, no possibility of harming. I think you're going to end up. Uh, Lugols is all. So I, if I were trying to do nice-looking dentistry, the, you'd probably end up with an orange-looking. I know. Yeah, or, orange so, looking. like, if you just, like, sterilize it and then, you know, rinse it gently so that there's just, like, a, you know, hardly anything left, but there's still a little bit of that in the cavity preparation, do you think that's a good idea? I, I, think, I think you could just, I, I, first off, let's talk about sterilizing the cavity preparation. I think it's absolutely important. It, 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 there's 1977, see how old I am? I even remember stuff from 77. Is that there was a meeting in, in, it was all about by 3M about why we have posterior, sen post treatment sensitivity from composites. Mm -hmm. And the Maori was one of the principal speakers. And the, at the unanimous conclusion is because the bacteria left underneath the composite. We're used to using mercury, mercury so damn toxic. You could leave plaque under there and put mercury on it and kill it. So the, uh, Obviously, you need to be treating this tooth as uh, you would expect the doctor to treat your abdomen if you were in there trying to take out the, the gold necklace you swallowed or something. You know, mm -hmm. when, you, when you get in there, use sterile technique. You know, you've got, you've got the area isolated. You disinfect that completely. And if you wanted to use a colored thing, you're fine. You can rinse it away. I think you could probably use there, – there, there's zinc chloride and there's two or three others that I've seen uh, – um, don't, I wouldn't use any of the uh, fluoride-containing products because it, it seems like they're impregnating everything with fluoride. Well, you know, like I'm having that issue. Like, what what can I what use? What you need to do is to send a thousand dollar a month to the uh, AMT's legal fund, and the next thing we need to do is to challenge all of these unapproved FDA drugs that are on the market. It's a fairly reasonable lawsuit, but you know, time to get airfare and get them up there and back and forth. It's going to cost you know several thousand dollars, but. Like Griffin Cole found out with a whole, you know, what it cost him, you know, 10 hours and a series of phone calls, that there's no approval for the fluoride varnishes that are used right, in schools like, the United States. This is against the law. We pass laws. If they want to do it, they have to change the law. So they say, oh, 
Everybody's got to comply with the FDA requirements except the dentist who knows so much about so much that they don't have to comply. So, yes, we can get that stuff off the market, but it's going to take action by concerned citizens who require the government to do the job we're paying them to do. And if they don't want to do the job we're paying them to do, we can balance the budget. We can let them go find some other line of employment. Right. So that's what Well, I we have to get the pirates that have taken over the ship out off the ship. <laughs> yeah. The, the crooks and criminals in Washington, D.C. are here. Uh, question, do you have any uh, resources on uh, microscope bugology, just basic, basic bugology? You know, I have a video that uh, I, uh, I think the Academy still has it. Um, if not, I probably got it nested away in some of my old computers. That was uh, uh, one that I used to use um, how to uh, identify organisms uh, and also how to do the irrigation exactly. and all that stuff. I have a whole video about that. It has some of the little clips and so forth. Like this. You're looking at pieces of it now instead of the whole, mm -hmm. the whole thing because it runs about an hour and a hour yes. and ten minutes, I think. But it has, but you know, the the, the bugology is uh, uh, one of the easier things to teach. It, it is it is not rocket science. If it moves, kill it. It's just that simple. Is it good bugs don't move? And so when you look under microscope, now that's the exception of water flowing. So if you if you were to watch a flood. What happens is the house and the Toyota and the, uh, the semi-trailer truck are all going in the same direction because it's in a flow of water. So sometimes if you take a sample with saliva, put the cover slip on, and immediately go over and look at it, it's going to look like a flood because it's mm -hmm. stuff right. moving around. So what I do is I take the sample at the very first part of my examination, smash the cover slip down, and set it aside. Then I do my visual examination, record the soft tissue and, and uh, the number of fillings and what the condition is and all that stuff. In the time I get done, I spend 10 or 15 minutes. <coughs> then I take the slide over and look under the microscope, unless my assistant has beat me over there and is saying, yeah, I got, got one over here. And so, anyway, so it, it, it quits flowing in those ten, five or 10 minutes you let it sit. And so that's not generally a problem if you, okay. if you don't rush to the microscope. But if you identify the flow, as it's identified different than bacteria that seem to be swimming upstream, all those guys need to die. They, 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 one of the toothbrush companies had a really good uh, electron micrograph of the large gliding rod. They actually look under a big blow-up picture. They look exactly like Cleopatra's barge. You know, they have, have little feelers on the side, mm -hmm. and they're all roaring along like this. Just trying to run. But it, they get around pretty good. Even the, even the modal coxi. Modal coxi won't. Is the, is the exception, it'll move, but it won't hurt you. It's often found if the hygiene is not particularly um, uh, high level, but it's not a particularly aggressive organism and, and, and will cause a urinary tract infection. So that, that mobile cocci are not necessarily good, but they're, they're not uh, nearly the aggressive yeah. that the spider sheep are. So you think the Academy has this video? Oh, yeah, Kim, Kim would have it. Ask Kim, and if she doesn't, ask me. Okay. I look at a lot of, uh, you know, kids, and sometimes uh, I'll see, like, purple areas in, on the gum tissue between their lower teeth, and I'm pretty sure it's spirochetes that are involved. And these kids are, like, real poor kids, and, and I'll just tell them to put some salt on a soft bristle toothbrush and, and brush the salt. And I try to describe to them what the spirochetes look like and try to motivate them to do that. Do I, first of all, do you think it's probably the spirochetes involved in, in making the gums look well, purple? It doesn't make a difference. It's inflammation. The, the purple is, you know, is our, our blood vessels that are engorged with blood. And so the body is trying to counter a bacterial process that's going on there. So whether it's a spirochete or it's a, a modal rod or, a, you know, or one of the spinning rods, it doesn't make a difference. So you're, you're, and the trouble is it's not occurring just there. Is it they got a problem here? They got a problem here. They got a problem here. It, it, it's you know the, the, every every sulcus in that child's mouth has organisms that are producing inflammation, and that's and that's that's the bad news. The, 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 oh, I guess I had one little piece of good news that the um, what I found in my own mouth is that when you get rid of all the spirochetes and all the bad stuff, and forty years later you get. You don't want to hook up the water pick every time. I have a thing.
thing called a shower flosser, which is just a little tube that comes off the shower. So you can hose it off with the tap water. And uh, <clears throat> since the guys are swimmers, if you hit it with a hose fairly often, they'll be swimming in the drain. So, the, uh, so that's, the, uh, that's the $10 water pick, the uh, hose off of the shower. So, but it's, uh, but you, you can't put stuff in it that kills bugs like I was showing you with the water pick. And the other thing that's wrong with that, it doesn't pulse. Is that there's a lot of advantage in a water pick or a biojet or whichever one you use. It puts it blast and stop, blast and stop, because you're trying to displace fluid that's in the bottom of the sulfur. Well, if you were me, and you had like a limited amount of time with this young patient, and you you know saw the of course they get hit with the fluoride varnish right after I finish talking to them. Sometimes they're allowed to like stick it in their mouth themselves. Yeah, I, I don't know what to do. I, I, you know, you, you almost feel like maybe punching some of the people there, but it's best just to shut up and not say anything if you want well, to stay. You know, the, the fluoride varnish is not actually approved. However, uh, uh, Lugol is a nutrient form of iodine. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I think, I think really what you should do is, is and, and matter of fact, if you go back to the scientific literature, the, at the turn of the century, this is what physicians did to treat gum diseases. They painted the gums either with um, silver nitrate or uh, povidone iodine, and so they just paint, they, did, they didn't do dentistry, they were physicians, they just painted the gums with, with something that kills germs, and that helped gum disease. You could do a much better job on children by painting their gums with a, a, an iodine solution, have them push around and spit it back out, than you could by putting 50,000 parts per million. Uh, you know, for a varnish, do you, do you ever recognize the smell? The basis of it is copolite. So all they did is they took copolite and they added huge amounts of fluoride. It, it just horrified me completely. So what you would recommend, like maybe using iodine rather than telling them to use salt or the, to use salt every day? You know, they're going to have salt at home. So, you know, the, the, for, a, for a daily home care, you know, the salt or, or if you want to get them away from the uh, sodium, you can get them to use light salt, which is potassium chloride. Um, or you can brush with magnesium sulfate, which is Epsom salt. Epsom salt is, not, is, 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 is another thing they can brush with, and it tastes a little magnesium -y, and so it doesn't have the, the pungent taste. So I think whatever they use at home, you should, it should be uh, something you can eat and not hurt them. And so, yes, I, I'm, I'm okay with the salt or the or, or taxi chloride or Epsom salt. I've seen it work. I've, I've seen them come back, and, and the, the purple's gone after they've used the salt. Yeah, it's, it, if you're looking at the bugs, what you'd see is you didn't get them in the back. And that's, and that's, that's why we've got to go to the squirters, because where they're stuck in between molars, there's such a, the molar is a big square tooth, so there's a space right in between them that nothing gets to with a brush. And that's why you've got to come in and squirt it out. So. We've probably got time for one more, but anybody on horses? Anybody on a horse? Is, is there a reason why you don't seal your microscope slides to prevent streaming? Yes and no. I do seal the microscope slides if I'm going to look at them quite a bit later. But uh, these are samples you use, it, you use it once and then throw it away. So, so if I if I have if my hygienist has a slide she wants me to look at, and she knows I'm you know up to my neck and grinding, what she does is she seals it with the clear fingernail polish is the is the sealer, and uh, and so you seal it, and but you need to let this that that. It's time is what stops the streaming. It, it, you, even if you seal them, if you look at them real quick, they're still streaming. So, it, but uh, sealing is a way. What he's talking about is sealing up the slide. You can take a, a clear fingernail polish and change the four corners of the slide. Those spirochetes will be alive, you know, two two hours later. So you're not under a time pressure. I've got to go take a look at the slide. The hygienist wants me to see if she's done a good job. I don't have any urgency in that. I can come over in the next two hours. Or I can send my assistant go take a look and tell her. Right, thank you, David. Thank Give David a hand. He does a great job, doesn't he? Um, lunch is upstairs, 18th floor. Be back here. At